me see here. Okay, uh, can everybody see my slides? Yes, yes. Perfect. Um, okay, thank you. So uh, if uh, anyone is interested afterwards in reaching me or uh, f uh, finding any of the um, uh, the primary papers, the data sets, the software, everything is uh, is at this uh, website. So what I want to talk about today is uh, this idea that uh, uh, pre-neural bioelectrical networks underlie a kind of somatic intelligence. And I want to talk about uh, the implications of this for um, for regenerative medicine, but also for evolution and, and some things like that. We can start by thinking about Alan Turing, who, who needs no introduction. This is the, the forefather of, uh, of, of computer science. And he was very interested in um, intelligence in different embodiments. He was interested in what, what, is, what is fundamental about intelligence uh, as aside from any one particular uh, implementation and uh, in, in, in the, the basics of computing and so on. But he also did this really interesting um, early work on, uh, on morphogenesis, uh, the idea of the generation of, of uh, pattern from chemical signals during embryonic development. And so one might ask, why would uh, somebody who's interested in, uh, in, in uh, uh, intelligence and in computation, why would they be interested in, in studying morphogenesis? And I think Turing, uh, although he didn't write explicitly about this, I think that being the genius that he was, he saw deeply that these are the same problem. And I think fundamentally, um, this is a very, um, very, very important idea that, 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 that developmental morphogenesis and intelligence are really the same problem. And here's why. Uh, we oftentimes, uh, there's this, uh, there's this idea that, um, uh, there are, let's say, let's say, uh, uh, collections of ants and termites and, and bird flocks are kind of collective intelligence. And then people think, uh, uh about, uh, well, is this really a, 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 an individual? Is it really a collective intelligence? How do we think about it? But then they say, well, those things are, are maybe controversial, but, but, but I am a true centralized intelligence, right? I, I am a single being, I'm a centralized intelligence. And of course, this isn't, this isn't correct because we are also made of parts. So, so our, our brains are uh, a collection of cells. We are all walking bags of cells, basically. Um, and this is the sort of thing that we're, we're made of. Uh, this is a single cell. This is called the lacrimaria. And uh, this is, of course, an independent organism. Uh, this is not a human somatic cell, but, but all, all of our cells were once independent uh, living organisms. And so you can see the, uh, the, the high level of competency and autonomy that this uh, it little, little creature has in uh, addressing the problems on its own scale. So physiological, metabolic, things like that. All of us made this amazing uh, journey across the Cartesian cut. We were all once a, uh, an, a, a quiescent oocyte, so just a single cell where people would say, well, that's just physics and chemistry. There's no cognition there. It's a, it's a chemical system. And then eventually we end up being uh, something like this, which is, which is a complex uh, organism with behavior and maybe even something like this, which is a very complex uh, has has human level metacognition and will make statements like I am unique and I have um, uh, mental properties that that don't uh, that don't exist in other creatures and and so on, and so the key thing to realize is that <clears throat> this this journey is incredibly slow and gradual. The oh, developmental biology offers no sharp lightning bolt where uh, to the left of that line, we were just chemistry and physics. And then boom, after this, now you're a cognitive uh, creature that, I mean, there's no such thing in developmental biology. It's a slow, gradual process. And so we really need to understand how the scale up of, uh, of, of, of cognitive capacities happens during this, uh, during this process, of course, on an evolutionary timescale, but also on each of us uh, on a developmental timescale. And this this connection between information in the brain and information in the body can be really uh, seen in the plasticity of certain biological forms. So here, for example, is a planarian. So this is a flatworm. Uh, th they have two interesting properties. One is that they're smart, and so you can train them uh, for specific memories, for specific behaviors, and they regenerate. So if I amputate the head off of this planarian, the tail will sit there and eventually regrow a new head. And so this is something that um, McConnell uh, discovered in the 60s, and then we later confirmed using modern um, automated uh, techniques. If you train a planarian to recognize these little bumpy disks as the place where they find food, and then you cut off their head, which contains their brain, the tail will eventually regrow a new head 
And that new head, uh, that new animal will show uh, behavioral evidence of recall. He will still remember the information. So these memories not only are potentially stored outside of the brain, but also imprinted onto a completely new brain as it develops. So you see this ability of information moving uh, across the body. You see the, the consilience of, of, uh, of information about, about shape, about anatomical shape, that we have to rebuild, that the head is missing, we have to rebuild it, but also restoring this, uh, this, this, uh, this, this, this uh, uh, cognitive information. So these are really, really quite connected. That plasticity, that ability to, to, to uh, recover personal identity, and by the way, if you're interested in philosophy and the question of personal identity and the question of what happens if somebody makes a copy of me, are they also me? What, what happens to the, to the individual? Here, you can do this in planaria, right? You cut them into pieces and every piece will have the original information. Now, who is the original, right? It's a kind of a philosophical puzzle. But this, this plasticity um, exists in vertebrates as well. So this is a frog tadpole. So here's the, uh, here's the brain, here are the nostrils, the mouth. Um, and what we've done is we've removed the, we've, we've produced the tadpole with no primary eyes, but we did put some eye precursor cells on the tail and they form a perfectly good eye. And that eye uh, connects to the spinal cord. And these, we, we show using this device that we've built, uh, we show that these animals can see quite well. So we can train them on visual tasks, even though this eye does not connect to the brain and it's not in the head. So that plasticity, and you didn't need uh, um, you know, thousands of generations for this to evolve, that this, this architecture is already ready to uh, be scrambled in this way and still have uh, adaptive function. And that has huge implications for evolution. So the interesting thing about uh, biology is that um, we, are, we are all multi-scale systems not only structurally, so we all know that we're made of organs, tissues, cells, and, and molecular networks, but actually functionally at each level, these, um, these layers uh, solve uh, various problems in various spaces. So they're competent uh, to solve different, uh, different types of problems in different action spaces. Now, uh, and, this, and we call this the multi-scale competency architecture. Now, what, what do I mean by these problem spaces? Well, we are, and, and many animals are, uh, very primed and very good at recognizing agency and intelligence in a three-dimensional space. So, so me medium-scale bodies moving at medium speeds through, uh, through space and doing intelligent things, it's easy for us to recognize that. But it should be clear that, that when we look at various systems and assign to them some kind of... Um, uh, estimate of their intelligence, we're really taking an IQ test ourselves because we're not very good at recognizing intelligent behavior in other problem spaces. So for example, imagine that you had an innate feeling for your body chemistry, the way that we have vision and hearing and so on. Imagine if you could feel your, your, your blood chemistry. I think it would be very easy for us to recognize um, the, the, the workings of our, of our liver and kidneys and so on in physiological space as different kinds of uh, intelligent behavior, meaning prob problem solving behavior with different levels of competencies. So the spaces that we deal with are physiological space, the space of all possible gene expression. So this is a transcriptional space. And my favorite, which is morphous space, right? This is the, the, the space of the different parameters that establish different anatomical shapes, like these different um, head shapes. So I'll give you, uh, we're gonna spend most of today talking about uh, problem solving in this uh, anatomical space, but I wanna say one thing about um, transcriptional and physiological spaces, just to give you an idea of just, just how clever um, our, our cells really are. So uh, this is a planarian. This is a, what, that flatworm that I, uh, that I talked to you about. And what we found is that if we expose this, if we um, expose this planarian to barium, a solution of barium chloride, uh, what happens is barium is a non-specific potassium channel blocker. So, so um, the cells can't uh, pass potassium and uh, that makes the cells very unhappy. And especially in the head where there's lots of neurons that want to um, transfer potassium, um, their heads explode. Their heads literally, literally explode overnight. And if you leave them in the barium, what happens is that a couple, but within a, in a week or two, they regrow a new head and the new head is completely insensitive to barium. So we asked the simple question transcriptionally, what is different about this new head? Why does this new head uh, not mine the barium? So we just compared all the genes that are expressed in these guys versus these guys. And we pulled out a very small number of genes. 
Um, and now here's the amazing, the amazing fact is that a, pl a planarian never encounter barium in the wild. So there's, ne there's no evolutionary history for barium exposure. There's no, uh, there's no reason why they should have a built-in um, a, a mechanism for expressing certain genes when they encounter barium. This is a completely novel problem for them. And so you can think about this as, as being stuck in this, in this nuclear reactor control panel where every you know, 20,000 genes or however many they have, every knob is, is one gene and you're faced with it's, it's melting down, you're faced with this terrible physiological stressor. How do you know which genes to turn on and off if you've never seen this, this, uh, this, this challenge before? And the amazing thing uh, uh, is that you don't have time to, to do a random walk. You don't have time for a uh, gradient descent. The cells don't turn over very fast the way that you might in a bacterial uh, colony that you might see that. Uh, they, they find their way through this transcriptional space uh, very, very efficiently given a completely novel uh, challenge. So, so it's when we don't know how this works, it's very interesting to, to think about how this works. So um, overall, what we are interested in is diverse systems. So not traditional brainy systems necessarily, but all kinds of other things, uh, all, uh, but whether, whether um, uh, evolved or designed that are able to navigate different problem spaces with different degrees of competency. So, so uh, all, all the way, and, and, and this, um, this, this notion of having different degrees of competency in navigation was described by, by first by, by Norbert Wiener and, uh, and uh, colleagues in a very um, kind of cybernetic scale of thinking about how behavior could be controlled. And what he wanted to do was, what, what, they, what they wanted to do was establish um, a kind of uh, a continuum with, with some transitions here, all the way from completely passive behavior, which you would just say is just physics, all the way up to what, uh, what we see in humans, which is meta metacognition and things like that, and all of the steps in between in a way that was not tied to specific architecture. So we're not saying brain, we're not saying neural network, we're, uh, we're not making any uh, assumptions about what the substrate is. What we're saying is there are different kinds of behavioral competencies with respect to uh, reaching specific goal states in that space. And when he says teleology, he doesn't mean magic and he doesn't mean human level I know that I know what my goal is. It just means the ability of a system to reach a specific goal despite perturbations. And these are the different levels of sophistication for different systems that might be able to do that. And what that allows, this, this kind of approach allows us to do something interesting, which is the goal of, of my uh, framework, which, uh, which uh, I call T-A-M-E, TAME for Technological Approach to Mind Everywhere. It allows us to, to think about uh, using the same tools, a very wide range of potential agents. So, so yes, familiar uh, subjects of behavioral science, like, uh, like humans, like uh, mammals, uh, other mammals, uh, um, birds, maybe octopus, but also really weird creatures uh, like uh, colonial organisms, whole swarms, synthetic new life forms. I'll show you one at the end of, uh, at the end of this talk. Um, artificial intelligences that might be entirely software-based and maybe someday exobiological agents because all life on earth is basically an N equals one example of, of, of evolution. So um, we want general purpose tools to be able to recognize competencies. I'm not saying anything about consciousness. I'm not, at this point, I'm not saying anything about uh, human level intelligence. I'm saying basic problem solving competencies at different levels of uh, sophistication that, uh, that, that might exist in unfamiliar guises. And here's, uh, and here's my favorite example of that, which, uh, which I would like to talk about. Um, we all start life as a collection of embryonic blastomeres, and then eventually you get this. So this is a, uh, a cross section through um, a human torso. So you can see all the amazing uh, order that's here, right? So, so all the tissues and structures are all uh, uh, positioned and, and um, the, every, everything's in the right, this, the, of the right size, the right orientation, the right uh, uh, position relative to each other. Where is this amazing uh, amount of order encoded, right? Where, where is the pattern? Now, people are often tempted to say, well, it's in the DNA, but we can read genomes now and, and we know what's in the DNA. What's in the DNA is a description of the micro level hardware, the proteins that every cell gets to have. The DNA doesn't directly say anything about this large scale structure. The structure arises from the uh, behavior of individual cells, from the physiology that drives individual cells to interact and create something like this. So we're interested in that, that, uh, that, that collective behavior. We're interested in how groups of cells know what to make and when to stop building. 
uh, as workers in regenerative medicine, we'd like to know, well, if a part is missing, how do we recreate it? And as engineers, we want to go further and say, well, can we push these cells to do something else besides what they normally build? Can they, can they build something completely different? And so um, what I want to talk about is this, uh, the, this, the, the idea of uh, the end game of the, how, how I see the end game of this whole field is uh, with this notion of an anatomical compiler. So imagine that in the future, you will be able to sit down in front of a computer and draw the plant or animal that you want not at the level of molecular pathways, but at the level of functional anatomy. You're just gonna draw like here is this, uh, this th three-headed planarian. And uh, if we knew what we were doing, and if we had a mature, a mature uh, science of morphogenesis, this system would be able to compile that description into a set of signals that would have to be given to cells and cause them to build whatever you wanted them to build. To be super clear, this anatomical compiler is not a 3D printer. We are not talking about micromanaging the position of all the cells and, and, and creating a 3D printed ear or something like this. Or the, the, the anatomical compiler is a communications device. It is a way to convert from, from, from an anatomical specification to the signals that have to be given to a collective of cells to get them to build something the way that they normally build other things in, in, um, in, in development and regeneration. Why do we want this thing? Why do we want this thing? Well, um, all problems of biomedicine, with the exception of, let's say, infectious disease, boil down to the control of collective cell behavior. If we had a way of convincing cells to build anything, an arbitrary structure, we would automatically have the solutions to birth defects, to traumatic injury, to cancer, to aging, to degenerative disease. We could make a synthetic biobots on demand. All of these things would be solved if we solved this a simple problem of how do you communicate to a collective of cells? What do you want them to build? Now, you might think that, so, so why don't we have this yet, right? We've, we've had all this incredible advance in, in genomics and, and, and molecular biology. Why don't we have something like this? Well, I just want to show you a very simple um, uh, example of a, of a problem. Here's a, uh, here's a basic uh, uh, axolotl larva, baby axolotl. They have legs. And so this is a baby, uh, it's a salamander, they, they have legs. Here is a uh, frog larva. This is a tadpole um, of a xenopus frog. Um, they do not have legs. And so in our lab, we can do something which is make a chimeric embryo. We call it a frogolotl. And uh, I can ask a simple question. Uh, do you expect the frogolotl to have legs? And uh, you have the genome. So, so we have the genome for the axolotl. We have the genome for the frog. Can you tell me if a frogolotl is going to have legs or not? And if it does have legs, are those legs going to be made entirely of axolotl cells or will they have some frog cells included? Yes. So, the, so, the, the, so, so unfortunately, we have absolutely no uh, uh, conceptual um, uh, framework that will allow you to derive that information from the genomics. It's, we, we just can't do it. And so, so where we are today is, is here. We're very good at manipulating molecules and cells. So pathways, genomic editing, those kinds of things. We're very good at that. But we're really quite a long way from control of large scale structure and function, which is really what we want. So what I would argue is that where we are in biomedicine today is here. It's where computer science was in the 40s and 50s, where you had to interact with the machine at the level of the hardware. So, so CRISPR, um, uh, pathway, uh, pathway editing, single molecule approaches, protein design, all of that stuff, all the most exciting advances in, in molecular medicine are around the uh, control of the hardware. And we know very well from the information technology revolution that that's just the beginning. And that what we really want to understand is how to take advantage of the higher level uh, 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 affordances of, of, of living bodies and really, uh, really exploit uh, what, what ends up being uh, the agency of, of, uh, of cells and tissues as they solve various problems. And so that's, I wanna, I wanna talk today about um, those, those kinds of approaches. So, so I talk a lot about competencies and intelligence. And so let's, let's give a definition. I like this definition by William James, which is intelligence is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. So what we're talking about here is uh, again, when we say goal, it, we, we don't mean something that's a second order. I, I know what my goal is. I mean, that's the hum, humans have that ability, but you don't need that. Uh, it's the ability of some system to exert energy to reach the same state despite uh, ver in, in, in various means. Now, why would there need to be various means? Because there might be interferences of some sort that prevent it from doing the thing that it normally does. And so the uh, degree of intelligence and the type of intelligence that a system has is how it handles those interventions. What does it? Uh, what what abilities does it have to get to where it needs to go? 
in its in its problem space despite various interventions. Um, somebody once, uh, well, I wish I could remember who who said this. Somebody had this great quote where <clears throat> intelligence is is a continuum that makes the difference between two magnets trying to get together and Romeo and Juliet trying to get together. Right? The difference is simply in the degree of um, of, of sophistication of things that are going to happen when you try to prevent them from reaching their goal. In one case, uh, very little sophistication at all. All they can do is, is try to minimize uh, the energy. And in the other case, lots of uh, sophisticated uh, tricks to try and get there. So let's talk about this kind of intelligence that's related to uh, biomedicine in particular. So development is incredibly reliable. And so we know that an embryo most of the time gives rise to a normal, very complex body, but it isn't hardwired. And so if, if you cut this embryo in half, you don't get two half bodies, you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins. And that's because in this morphogenetic state space, the ability to reach its goal, this ensemble of states that we consider a normal, uh, healthy uh, embryo, you can get there through uh, from, from a variety of starting positions. And in fact, as I'll show you momentarily, by uh, avoiding various local maxima, um, of avoiding local uh, various various problems and doing new things to get to where you need to go. So here's here's one of very uh, sort of well known example. This is a salamander known as the axolotl. These guys regenerate their limbs, their eyes, their jaws, portions of their brain and heart. Um, and and here's what the limbs look like. If you amputate anywhere along the axis of the limb, it will regenerate. The cells will grow exactly what's needed, no more, no less and give you a complete perfect limb. Now, the most, uh, many amazing things about this, but the most amazing thing is that they know when to stop. These cells are growing. No individual cell knows what a finger is or how many fingers you're supposed to have, but the collective makes exactly the right number of fingers. And then it stops when, when a correct salamander limb has been uh, completed. And if you deviate at that point and, and, you, and you cut off some fingers and whatnot, it will continue to grow. And it will only stop when the correct pattern has, has completed. So. Uh, so, so if if you if you're into computer science, the, this looks like some sort of means ends analysis. It basically it's an error minimization scheme that allows the system to detect deviations from a from a stored um, set point and 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 uh, work and work towards that. Now, now salamanders aren't the only ones that 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 have this. A human uh, liver, for example, is highly regenerative. Um, even the ancient Greeks knew that. I have no idea how how they knew that. Uh, human children regenerate their fingertips. Uh, deer regenerate uh, large amounts of bone, uh, vasculature, and innervation every year. So, so there's some some uh, mammalian examples of of regeneration. Deer an example. But, but um, deer an example. Here's one of the uh, one of my uh, kind of uh, kind of favorite uh, favorite examples because uh, this this illustrates a very interesting point uh, that you can think about as uh, top down control. So this is this is the uh, cross section through a um, uh, through the lumen of a uh, of a of a salamander, and uh, what you can see normally is there's about eight to, there's about eight to ten cells that um, uh, form this kind of um, this kind of structure. And one thing you can do here is that you can make um, you can make these cells larger, uh, much much larger. And when you do that, when you make them larger, uh, the, the system adjusts, and and a smaller number of these large cells make the same shape lumen. And now you can do the most amazing thing of all, which is to make the cells uh, incredibly large. And when you do that, um, just one cell will wrap around itself like this and form the exact same structure. And this is remarkable for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them being that this is a completely uh, different molecular mechanism. In the first case, you have cell-to-cell -cell communication and, and, and delta-notch signaling, and all these things that are important in, in, in forming um, oh, tubular genesis. In this case, it's cytoskeletal bending. And so in the service of a large-scale anatomical goal state, meaning that having a, tu a tubule of the right shape and size, different molecular mechanisms, different underlying molecular mechanisms are being called up to reach that state. So this is uh, this uh, if if, um, if you're if you're into uh, neuroscience this this is very familiar because in 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 cognition you have you have this this exact example we have large scale uh, kind of executive control and and, and goal directedness that has to uh, feed down into the individual um, uh, circuits and eventually to 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 muscle uh, uh, voltage states to to execute the problem it's a it's a top down control and it happens here in, in morphogenesis uh, uh, in, this, in this amazing example. So this is um, 
This is a different example that, uh, that we uh, discovered a few years ago, which really shows you uh, uh, the need to look for uh, competencies in unexpected places. So here again is our tadpole. Here are some eyes, the nostrils, the mouth is back here, the brain. And uh, these tadpoles have to rearrange their face to become a normal frog. And so it was thought that this process is very mechanical. So, so every normal tadpole looks the same. Every normal frog looks the same. And all then you would have to do is somehow the genome would just uh, program a set of um, uh, 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 hardwired motions where every part of the face would move in the right uh, in the right direction, the right amount, and then you get a normal frog from a normal tadpole. So we we tested the hypothesis, and so I think this is really critical before making any sort of um, assumptions about what uh, the level of uh, competency of a system is. You have to do experiments, and so we asked we we did this experiment. We said. Um, uh, I wonder if it really is hardwired. Let's, what, what we did was we made these called Picasso tadpoles. So basically they're scrambled. Everything's in the wrong place. The jaws are off to the side. The eye might be on top of the head. Everything is scrambled. And what we found is that these animals make largely normal frogs. Why? Because all of these organs will move around in novel, unnatural paths. And in fact, sometimes go too far and actually have to move backwards. They, have to, they, they will all move around until they get to a correct frog pattern, and then they stop. So the genetics does not specify somehow a set of hardwired rearrangements. What it specifies is a system that is able to reach the goal despite completely uh, abnormal, unexpected starting positions. And this is very important. Evolution, and I think this is a more general claim that I would make, is that evolution doesn't just make specific solutions to specific problems. It actually creates hardware that implements a problem-solving machine that is able to exert um, uh, problems of, of, of various kinds of information processing to reach regions of anatomical space, uh, physiological space, and so on, despite novelty. And I'll show you a, a bunch of examples of that. Um, so what we started thinking about then was 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 this. I mean, this this is the typical uh, story that uh, that appears in the textbooks, which is uh, the process of morphogenesis. Is this you have genes turning each other on and off. They make effector proteins. There are local interactions in terms of physics. And then eventually this, this magical process of emergence where complexity arises from lots of simple local rules. Now, this is certainly true. And there are many systems where complexity arises from simple rules, but this is not the end of the story. And uh, in, in, in fact, uh, this, is, this is, I think, just a, a, the, a not even the major part of the story because what we see now is that it is, this, this process is not simply feed forward emergent. Uh, if this final form is deviated from its, uh, from its goal state by injury, mutations, teratogens, whatever, <clears throat> what will happen is that uh, loop, feedback loops will kick in both at the level of physics and at the level of genetics, which will, uh, which will uh, undergo various other uh, actions to try and get back to the state. So this is very much, in the cybernetic sense, this is very much a goal-directed system that re regeneration, regulative development, metamorphosis, all of these things uh, <clears throat> are, are trying to get to specific regions of anatomical morphospace. space. They exert energy to do so, and they have diverse competencies, more than just uh, pre, pre, um, <clears throat> sort of, sort of pre-wired pre kinds of behaviors. They exert various competencies in order to do that. Now, uh, this is, this is uh, on the one hand, this is uh, nothing, nothing too new. Biologists are well aware of feedback loops um, and homeostatic uh, kinds of loops like this. So, so pH, temperature, and so on. Uh, of course, we know cells do this. But the interesting thing about this process is that the set point for that uh, homeostatic process is not a scalar. It's not a single number. It's not just pH, it's not, not just pH or metabolic level. It is a, uh, an anatomical descriptor. So it's, it's, a, it's a shape. So, so that leg will continue to regenerate until a correct salamander leg has formed. So in some sense, uh, it, is a, it is a descriptor of our, of our complex multicellular anatomy here that's, that's driving this thing. And so this whole kind of uh, odd view of, 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 of looking at these, at these systems as navigational agents, um, uh, as opposed to just emergent, uh, emergent physics and chemistry, uh, makes a very strong prediction. It suggests that if there is an, an explicitly encoded set point somewhere, then we ought to be able to find it. So find the physical mechanism of that encoding. We ought to be able to uh, decode it. And so to understand, uh, to be able to read it out. And uh, we ought to be able to rewrite it, to respecify it. And, and that's, what, that's what we've been doing. Um, and I'll show, you, I'll show you how that works. Uh, one of the sort of conceptual uh, implications of this is really important. It means that if this is true, then 
we have the ability on a biomedical level to rewrite that set point without having to change the machine. In other words, the, 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 the amazing thing about your thermostat in your house is that you can change the set point without needing to rewire the thermostat. The hardware stays exactly the same, but you can make it do new things. And computers, of course, are, uh, are reprogrammable. And that's, that's the beauty of it. You can run multiple things on the same hardware. Uh, currently, molecular medicine is, is all about this portion. That is, uh, if you want to make a change here, we have to figure out which genes we would need to, let's say, CRISPR um, to make that change happen. And in general, mo moving backwards, this is an incredibly difficult inverse problem that's going to limit the applications of, of, of CRISPR and genome editing technologies, because in general, you cannot reverse this. We have no idea what genes to change. If you wanted a salamander with um, uh, threefold symmetry instead of bilateral symmetry, what genes would you change? We, we, have, we have no idea. So, so it would be really nice to, to if it were true that uh, 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 collect cellular collectives had a set point, you could change the set point, and uh, it would then do, uh, it would then build. You wouldn't have to solve this terrible inverse problem. So um, how does the brain um, handle a goal-directed navigation in, uh, in its problem space? Well, uh, of course, uh, it's got this hardware where um, uh, individual cells have these little ion channel proteins that enable the cell to reach a resting potential. And those potentials are propagated to their neighbors through these gap junctions. So you have this electrical network. And that electrical network, uh, that, that, that hardware allows a certain um, a set of uh, behavioral software <laughs> where, and, and here you can actually see the readout in this, this, gr this group did this amazing um, uh, video of the electrical activity in a living zebrafish brain. And so neuroscience is committed to this idea that all of the cognitive content of this, of this system, of this mind, is uh, encoded in the, this physiology and in this electrical activity, that if we were able to read and understand, basically decode, and this is what, what people work on, neural decoding, <clears throat> if we could decode the, this, this electrical activity, we would know what the memories, the goals, the capacities of the, of the system are. So the good news is that this amazing uh, architecture, right, of this hardware and software is extremely ancient. In fact, it's as old as bacterial biofilms. Um, most cells have uh, electrical connections with each other. All cells have ion channels that set their electrical state. And what you can do is you can, you can, you can run a, um, a very parallel kind of research program uh, using this, all of the techniques from, from, uh, from uh, um, uh, computational neuroscience to try and decode the uh, information processing of the body cells as they try to solve anatomical problems. Um, and, here, and here it is parallel to this brain scan. This is, uh, this is a frog embryo putting, its, um, uh, putting itself uh, together. And you can see, we can, we can now image all the electrical uh, states as this happens and try to decode them. So the um, isomorphism is very strong because, because here, what you have here is uh, the, the DNA, which determines the micro level hardware, this becomes uh, an, an excitable uh, medium, which has uh, the ability to, uh, to have a certain, uh, certain um, el electrical uh, um, Im implemented information processing tasks. And what it does is it controls, it makes decisions to at large scale decisions to control muscles to move you through three dimensional space. That same architecture exists in your body. It's extremely ancient, both evolutionarily and developmentally. And what it does is use the exact same kind of tricks. So the DNA specifies the, the channels, but then you get this excitable medium that is able to have memories and decision-making um, at the level of the network. And what it does is issue commands to all kinds of cells, not just muscles, and those commands move your body configuration through morphous space. That process takes you from the shape of, of, of an egg in an early embryo through uh, progressive uh, stages, and, uh, and if you're a caterpillar, further through metamorphosis to become a butterfly, and, 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 and so on. So uh, the exact same thing. What evolution does is pivot the same trick, this, uh, this ability of electrical networks to process information and to integrate information through different problem spaces, starting off with, uh, with, with, with uh, metabolic and then uh, moving forward into, into uh, anatomical and eventually uh, behavioral and eventually linguistic in the case of humans. So we developed some tools to study all of this. So, so here's a time-lapse movie of the frog embryo. This is done using a voltage-sensitive fluorescent dye. So this, was, um, this, this technique was, uh, was, was developed by uh, Danny Adams to uh, look uh, to, to help uh, 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 characterize what the, what the cells are saying to each other. We also do a lot of computational modeling to link to the molecular biology 
what ion channels and pumps and gap junctions are responsible for these for these things. And I want to show you two. Um, uh, I want to show you two uh, uh, kinds of patterns. Uh, so so this is we call this the electric phase. Uh, uh, this is one frame taken from a, a from a voltage movie of a of a frog embryo putting its face together. And what you see is that long before the genes turn on to actually become uh, to actually uh, uh, regionalize and then implement the, the face anatomy, you already can read out the pattern memory that tells these cells what to do. Here's where the mouth is going to go. Here's where the eye is going to go. The other eye will come later. Uh, to you know the placodes out here. All this this pattern is already there. We know this pattern is instructive. Because if you move any of this, and I'll show you in a minute how we do, how we do it, the gene expression moves and then the anatomy moves. Uh, we'll show you that. So, so this is a normal pattern that's required for face development. This is uh, a, um, a pathological pattern that uh, occurs when you uh, uh, inject a human oncogenes into an embryo. Eventually, they'll make a tumor, but before that... Uh, that uh, tumor is, is uh, um, histologically apparent, you can already see from the cell's aberrant voltage signature that they've disconnected from the electrical network of the rest of the body. They have their own weirdly depolarized voltage. They're basically like amoebas at that point. They're just gonna uh, uh, treat the rest of the body as external environment. They, they've, this is metastasis. They've rolled back to their individual unicellular past. So, um, so how do we, um, how do, we do these kinds of uh, experiments? We've borrowed a lot of tools from neuroscience we do not use, there, there are no applied fields, no electrodes, no radiation, no electromagnetic radiation, nothing like that. This is, this is manipulating the uh, native interface, the native bioelectrical interface that uh, cells expose to each other to uh, enable them to program each other's activity collectively. So what those are, are ion channels and gap junctions. So we can use the, all of the techniques from neuroscience. So we can, we could mutate the channels to give them new properties. We can put in new channels. We can block channels pharmacologically. We can do it with light. So optogenetics, all the same tools. It's very interesting that neither the tools nor the concepts of um, uh, neuroscience can tell the difference between brains and other tissue. So all of the stuff works. So, so we do, we, 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 we steal everything from neuroscientists, all the neurotransmitter um, machinery and drugs, optogenetics, uh, active inference, perceptual bistability, you name it. All, all of these concepts are uh, directly transferable because the difference between, uh, uh, between other cells and neurons are, uh, th there are some important differences, but, but, but all of them are capable of the key thing, which is to make these electrically active information processing networks. So um, let me give you some examples of what happens when you make some of these changes. So, so one thing you can do is we can micro inject into this frog embryo, some RNA that encodes an ion channel, uh, let's say a potassium ion channel that will set the same electrical state that we observed in uh, the eye field in that uh, electrical face, uh, the, the embryo, the, the, electrical, um, <clears throat> the electric face in the embryos. When you do this, uh, this, what you have communicated to the cells is that they should form an eye. And you can do this to cells in the gut, on the tail, anywhere, not just in the anterior neurectoderm where the textbooks tell you are the only cells competent to make eyes. That's actually not true. If you go further up the chain of command and, and, and uh, 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 edit the bioelectrical pattern, uh, and any any cells in the body in the in the in this body will make a will make a complete eye. These eyes have all the right uh, layers of retina, optic nerve core. You know, uh, uh, um, all all the all the stuff is here. <clears throat> Notice a um, couple of interesting features here. One feature is that what we have not done is reprogrammed specific stem cells for specific fates. We, 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 we put in a very simple signal. We don't try to micromanage this, the cells. Uh, this is basically a subroutine call. We're communicating to the collective that it should, uh, that, that, uh, that the eye uh, state is uh, what, it should, what it should make. We are not trying to um, micromanage uh, the uh, the individual cells, and so this is modularity. This is this is really like a subroutine call. We just say build an eye here. The cell, the the, the all the downstream cascades turn on after that. The second uh, amazing um, uh, competency that these cells have is they can do uh, what uh, ants and termites do, which is recruitment. So um, here is uh, here is a lens. This this ectopic lens is sitting out in the flank of a of a of a tail somewhere. These blue cells are the ones that we've actually injected with ion channels, but there's not enough of them to make a proper lens. And so what they do is they recruit their neighbors, these other brown cells that are completely wild type, there's no extra channel there, but they're recruited by these cells as secondarily. So there's two levels of instruction. We instruct these cells, hey, make an eye. These cells instruct their neighbors, 
there's not enough of us, you've got to help. And so they have the ability to detect whether, or whether there's enough of them to, um, to, 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 do the, to do the task. And if there's not, they have the ability to, to, to instruct their neighbors to join in. And these are, these are cells that otherwise would have made uh, pieces of the tail. And so, and so these are some, some really interesting capacities of this, of the cellular collective to get its job done. Uh, we can make, um, so, so in addition to eyes, we can make uh, extra limbs uh, here. You can make extra four brains. You can make extra hearts. We can make otocysts or uh, inner ear organs, or you can make fins. Now that's interesting because tadpoles don't have fins. Uh, it's more of a fish thing. We'll get to that uh, momentarily, but so, so, Targeted misexpression of ion channels, meaning creating a new bioelectrical state, calls up different organs. You can uh, not, not individual cell states, but actual organs. And we can take advantage of this biomedically. For example, here's a frog. Frogs normally do not regenerate their legs. So if the leg is lost 45 days later, there's, there's nothing going on here. There's a cross section. We came up with a cocktail. Uh, and this is, uh, this is the work of Kelly Chang in my lab, who uh, uh, basically uh, created a cocktail that, that, that triggers uh, regeneration decision in this wound, 24 hour treatment, and then legs grow for up to a year and a half. And we never touch them during that point. But, but after, after 24 hours, already, you, already the signals have been passed to convince the cells that this is the path through morphous space they should be taking, not towards scarring, but towards regeneration. And so immediately uh, you turn on these um, MSX1, which are these pro, pro, uh, with pro regenerative gene. Uh, by 45 days, you already have some toes, you've got a toenail up here, and eventually a very respectable frog leg that is touch sensitive and motile, meaning it's functional. So the idea for regenerative medicine is that we should be looking for triggers for, for ways to communicate to the cells what structure they should be building, not trying to micromanage the process uh, the, the, you know, the, whole, the whole time. And so I have to do a disclosure here because uh, David Kaplan and I are um, scientific co-founders of a company called Morphoceuticals Inc., which seeks to now take those uh, discoveries and move them into mammalian. And so, so we're doing this now in, in, in rodents. Um, hoping to uh, learn to do organ regeneration and, and ultimately, of course, human patients some, someday. So um, I want to switch uh, a little bit to this, uh, to this other model system, these, these planaria. And, and, and as I've told you, the planaria are amazing. They're so good at repairing uh, body damage. They do this continuously. They're actually immortal. There's no such thing as an old planaria, and they continuously replace the dying cells. And, uh, and, and as a result, uh, individual worms are basically immortal. And the amazing thing uh, about that is that when you cut them into pieces, each piece needs to know what it's missing and what needs to be rebuilt. So that anatomical control that makes them cancer resistant and, and, and immortal and so on, needs to be able to, to always recognize what part needs to go where. And so typically it's 100% reliable. If I amputate the head and the tail and I take this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this middle fragment, it will give rise to a perfectly normal one-headed worm. Now, um, one of the interesting uh, things that we found is that there's an electrical circuit in this fragment that determines how many heads and how many tails it's supposed to have. That's the memory. The memory is literally electrical. And, <clears throat> and so uh, what we can do is we can take this, this one-headed animal with normal uh, transcriptional profile. So the anterior genes are in the head, not in the tail. And when you amputate this guy, he gives rise to a two-headed worm. This is not Photoshop. These are real animals. Why would I just told you that it's complete, that it's hundred percent fidelity. Why would it give rise to a two-headed worm? Well, uh, that's because what we first did was to, uh, use uh, drugs that target ion channels and the gap junctions to reset the electrical pattern memory, and this is normal, this is what the fragment normally has, one head, one tail, we can reset that to say two heads. And you can see it's kind of messy where the technology is still being worked out, but, uh, but we can reset this pattern to be two heads. And then when you cut, then it makes a two headed animal. Now here's the really critical part. This electrical, uh, re, uh, um, electrical map is not a map of this two headed animal. This is an electrical map of this perfectly anatomically normal one headed animal. It's a latent memory, meaning it doesn't do anything until we injure it. And when you injure it, that's when the cells consult this map and, this, and, and realize they need to make two heads and that's what they do. So a single body, a single one-headed planarian body can store one of two different representations of what a correct planarian looks like. I promised you at the beginning that if we have this homeostatic loop, you have to store the set point somewhere. Somewhere you have to say what the correct information is. How does it know what's correct? This is how. That information 
is stored in electrical memories that we can actually now read out and edit and write to some extent, much like people are trying to incept false memories into brains. Uh, so another kind of neat thing about this is that if you're interested in the brain and uh, this ability, they call it mental time travel, the ability to remember things or imagine things that are not true right now, right? So the ability of a system to, to store states that are not actually true right now, um, that time shifting, that's what you see here. This, this electrical memory is a counterfactual. It is not a true description of what my anatomy looks like. It is a counterfactual memory of what I will do if I get injured in the future. Okay? It's a memory of, of uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a plan for the future. It's a very primitive way of doing counterfactual memories that might be um, the kind of evolutionary precursor to, to, to complex counterfactual thought in brains. Now, why do I keep calling this a memory? Because if you... Um, if you cut these two-headed animals and you take this uh, this uh, this this uh, middle uh, middle fragment with no more manipulation, it will continue to form two-headed animals. Now, keep in mind, there's no genetic uh, there's no there's been no genetic change here. We haven't rewritten the genome. The hardware is exactly the same. What we've done is given it a brief physiological stimulus that altered the memory of what this uh, of what the set point for this regenerative process is. So the question of what determines the number of heads in a planarian is kind of subtle. It isn't the DNA. What the DNA does is produce an electrical machine that by default stably settles on the memory of a one-headed uh, structure. But it's rewritable and it has memory. And once you rewrite it to a two-headed state, that's what it keeps. And we do have a way of actually turning them back so we can take these two-headed animals and uh, uh, rewrite the memory back to a one-headed. So. So here you are, you see it, you see a video of, of what these guys are doing. Uh, this is all the properties of memory. It's long-term stable, it's rewritable, it has conditional recall, which I just showed you, and it has discrete, uh, discrete behaviors. And so um, what we uh, uh, are, are doing now, and um, uh, this is, you know, we're, we're very interested in collaborations, and then Srini and I are, are collaborating on these kinds of things, is to... Uh, take what we know about the, uh, the state space of these electrical circuits and map them to anatomical outcomes, which are attractors in this morphous space, and understand how that process gives rise to the, these kinds of amazing abilities, such as uh, if the system is deviated, it comes back, it recovers missing information. These are all things that people who study uh, uh, artificial neural networks and connectionist models of cognition, these are all things that, that people study. And so we want to we um, you know, kind of integrate, uh, integrate that field. Um, interestingly, this is not just about head uh, number, it's also about shape. So if we perturb the electrical network in this, in this guy when he tries to regenerate his head, you can get the same genetics to form a flat-headed P. felina or a round-headed S. mediterranea. Uh, with, and, and the distance between this guy and these species is about 100 to 150 million years. So uh, what you can do by, by, by changing uh, the electrical pattern memories is to select between attractors in the state space that normally correspond to other species. One way that could have happened is that is, is genetic assimilation. So, so um, an, a, a, a bioelectric, uh, environmentally induced bioelectric change that causes head shape change that then eventually ends up being uh, assimilated into the genome as changes in ion channel properties and whatever. So evolution might use this very rapid. It's, a, it's akin to the Baldwin effect when, when learning becomes eventually assimilated into genetic uh, behaviors. Uh, evolution could, could make use of this very powerful uh, mechanism. And in fact, um, and so, so it's not just the head shape, right? It's the it's the shape of the brain and the and the distribution of stem cells is exactly like these other species. So you're literally making a head of another species. It's not even about existing other species. You can make uh, shapes that uh, are, don't belong to any species. So the morphous space of possible shapes is quite large. You can make uh, these spiky forms. You can make this uh, cylindrical kind of three dimensional thing. You can make combination forms. <clears throat> Evolution doesn't use it. Presumably, these don't make very successful worms. But the cells, the 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 hardware, the genetically specified hardware of a wild type uh, genome is perfectly happy to uh, to form these other uh, uh, these other um, these other forms. So what we're looking for is a full stack uh, kind of a, a, a framework in which we can start from knowing what the channels and pumps are that determine the hardware of the cells. But then we can now start to understand on a tissue level the changes in the uh, bioelectric uh, large scale properties, getting to what does that mean for organ specification and ultimately getting to a um, 
kind of a, a, a symbolic uh, algorithm of the decision making at the organ level about where heads and tails and all the other organs go. And we have this, we, we, we've, we've started work on this bioelectrical simulator. So Alexis Pytak has made this amazing system that allows us to actually sim simulate um, some of this stuff and, and link chemical networks with the electrical downstream electrical information processing. Um, I want to show you one a quick uh, success uh, case of using such a thing for biomedicine. This is a tadpole brain, forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. <clears throat> in animals that are exposed to teratogens like uh, nicotine or um, uh, 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 other other alcohol, uh, other other kinds of uh, teratogens, there are, there are severe brain defects. And we said, okay, could we make a computational model of the bioelectric uh, pattern of a normal brain and uh, show what happens to that pattern under various deformations? So we made this pattern, and and it showed us some really interesting. Um, uh, some really interesting uh, features of why things go wrong. And what that model was able to do is then say, okay, uh, if that's what happens to the electrical pattern, uh, could we, what, what would we need to do to fix it? So which channels and pumps could be open or closed to, to get back to the correct bioelectrical pattern, even though you were exposed to this uh, nasty teratogen. And in fact, we, we did it, we did this with, um, uh, with even uh, a genetic change, which is a mutation in notch. So notch is a very important neurogenesis gene in the absence of proper notch function. The forebrain is missing. The midbrain and hindbrain are just a big bubble. The animals have no behavior. It's, it's a very severe defect. What the computational model was able to do is pick out uh, a channel for us, specifically this HCN2 ion channel. That's some interesting properties. And the, and the model, the computer model, was, was, was told us that if we uh, turn on this channel, the, the bioelectric state should basically come back to normal. And when we and when we did that, and you can do this either genetically or through um, uh, a couple of drugs that are already human-approved drugs that target HCN2, they uh, these animals went back to normal. They had the, so so these animals have the same notch mutation, but you can see the the brain structure is normal. Their behavior, their IQs are in, 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 uh, distinguishable from controls. They get their behaviors back. So this is an amazing thing. Not only is the are we now to the point where a computational platform can actually predict therapeutics. By, by, by quantitatively asking what does the bioelectric change need to be, and then what drugs do we have that will induce that change. But this is an example of fixing a hardware defect, so the notch mutation, fixing a hardware defect in software by, by brief stimulation of the physiology with a drug. So I, now I'm not arguing that that's going to be true always. There are many hardware defects, let's say um, enzyme uh, mutations and so on, that are not fixable this way. But uh, but it is it is remarkable that some uh, some genetic um, defects can actually be repaired this way. So what we are working on is this uh, is this kind of a system um, that basically uh, it's it's a it's a and and you can uh, you can you can you can play around with this thing a little bit though, although it's a very early stage still. The idea is that uh, you should be able to uh, take your knowledge of the correct and the incorrect state, run it. The model will tell you which ion channels and pumps can be targeted. We know uh, what, what the drugs that exist for all these different uh, channels, and it should basically suggest uh, uh, electroceuticals, so, so combinations of drugs to address different kinds of problems uh, with um, you know, cancer, uh, 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 repair of injury, birth defects, and so on. And so just for the last uh, couple of minutes, I want to um, uh, say a couple of uh, quick things about uh, coming, coming back to this idea of let's, let's, let's zoom out from the biomedicine and, and just think about what, what we've learned about, uh, about intelligence and, and uh, cognition. Um, we know that this thing uh, has uh, competencies in a certain very small uh, cognitive light cone. Basically, uh, local environment is what it cares about. It has cells have a little bit of memory going back, a little bit of predictive power going looking forward in the future. But basically, both spatially and temporally, the goals that this system pursues are very small. Um, what evolution did is, is, is create a, a set of uh, policies for electrical networks that allow them to pursue much bigger goals. So this collective pursues the goal of having this anatomical state, and uh, you can deviate it and will do its best to get back there. Um, individual cells have no idea what a finger is or how many you should have, but the collective does. And, and, it's, the, and it's the network uh, that's able to do this. But it has a failure mode. The failure mode is cancer. And when cells disconnect from this electrical network, this is glioblastoma, they basically roll back to these individual cell behaviors and their light cone shrinks, okay? And so we can think about um, uh, the scaling up of cognition from individual cells that have a very small spatiotemporal 
uh, uh, cognitive capacity to larger, uh, larger networks that have uh, more computational capacity for memory, for prediction, and for integrating spatially information across a distance. This has a very clear biomedical, uh, 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 testable biomedical prediction, which is that um, well, here's, our, here's our, uh, our, our tumors induced by human oncogenes. What we can do is we can say, we're not going to change the hardware. We're going to leave the, the hardware defect in. We're not going to remove the cells or, or, or try to fix the, the genetic mutation. What we will do is force these cells to be in normal electrical communication with each other. And so when we inject the oncogene, what we also inject is a, uh, an ion channel that, that despite what the oncogene get, does, which is to electrically decouple the cells, it will um, cause them to stay connected. So this is, this is the oncoprotein here. It's very strongly expressed. In fact, it's all over the place, but there's no tumor. This is the same animal. There's no tumor because um, the physiology overrides the genetics. Some, some hardware defects can be fixed in software. So if you connect these cells to the group, they will not have the metastatic single cell goal pursuing behavior. They will work on a collective project, making nice skin, nice, nice muscle underneath, all of that stuff. So you can see how these, these ideas of, of cognitive scaling lead directly to novel therapeutic approaches that, uh, that had never been, uh, been tried before. So um, the last uh, two minutes or so, I just want to show you one, one uh, amazing um, uh, kind of uh, example of cellular uh, competencies and plasticity. We wanted to know whether cells could reboot their multicellularity and what their novel goals would be if we took them out of their normal context. And so this is the work I have to do a, a disclosure. Um, uh, Josh Bongard and I uh, have founded this, this, this company for computer design biorobotics. This is all, everything I'm going to show you is done in, in uh, collaboration with the Bongard lab. And uh, Doug Blackiston and my group did all the, all the biology and Sam Kriegman did the, the computer uh, science aspects. So what we did was we, uh, so, so, so Doug takes these, these frog embryos, he takes the skin cells from the top. These are, these are uh, cells fated to be, uh, to be epidermis, so, so, so skin, and he, we dissociate them and then, and then uh, just uh, pipette them down into this little, little depression. What might they do? Well, they might die, they might spread out, they might form a two-dimensional monolayer, many things they could do. What they do instead is, oops, uh, they uh, overnight, um, they, uh, they coalesce together like this, and they form, uh, they form this little thing we call a xenobot. Here it is. We call it a xenobot because Xenopus lavis is the name of the frog, and it's a biorobotics platform, so it's a biobot. One thing these xenobots do is they swim. They move. Um, how do they do it? They have little hairs called cilia on the outside of their bodies. Normally, the cilia are used to redistribute mucus down uh, the, the body of the frog. Um, but uh, here, what they do is uh, they row, and the, the ones on this side row this way, the ones on this side row that way, and so the thing moves on its own. It's a completely spontaneous. We don't pace it. We don't activate it. It's on its own. They have a wide variety of behaviors. They can go in circles. They can patrol back and forth like this. Just keep in mind, uh, this is skin. There's no neurons here. There's nothing else. Um, they have some collective behaviors, so these two can interact with each other. Uh, these are resting, doing nothing. This one is going kind of on a, on a long journey. Um, here it is navigating a maze, so it moves forward. Uh, it takes the turn without bumping into anything. It doesn't have to bump into the opposite side. It takes the corner, and then at this point, due to some internal dynamic, it uh, turns around and goes back where it came from. Uh, no, no, no control by us. This is completely spontaneous uh, behavior of these guys. Um, if you if you image the signaling, this is calcium signaling. It's very. Uh, th this is the kind of thing you would see. In, uh, in imaging brain activity. And so we are now, of course, uh, analyzing using information theory approaches, uh, what the integrated information is inside or, or in fact, uh, between, are they communicating? We, we don't know yet. Well, that, that, that remains to be determined. Um, they can regenerate. So if you cut them in half here, so think about, you can, you can cut them almost in half. Look at the amazing uh, force that it takes to, uh, to, 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 to fold this thing, uh, fold this thing up like that. So they do regenerate. And then here's the most, um, uh, uh, surprising, uh, thing of all, which is, uh, by modeling. So, so Sam and Josh computationally modeled this and basically evolved in an AI, uh, kind of, um, environment, uh, used, uh, used evolutionary algorithms to evolve different kinds of, uh, Xenobot shapes and, and, and simulate their activity. And one thing that we learned is that they like to make piles. They, they like to find loose material and collect it into, um, uh, into, into piles. And so we, we, chat, we tested whether that would be true of real bots. We gave them a bunch of uh, loose material. So these are cells. These white things are just uh, 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 loose skin cells. And we found something incredible is that 
yeah, in fact, in fact, they run around and they collect these, these cells and they collect them into piles and they compact and the piles become the next generation of xenobots, which then mature and go on to do exactly the same thing. So they just continue to make, uh, re to reproduce copies of themselves. Now, a couple of interesting things. First, the only reason this works is because the xenobots, like us and like evolution, are working with an agential material. They're not working with passive particles. They're working with an agential material that also knows how to cooperate with each other to become something interesting, meaning another xenobot. So this is, um, this is, this is taking advantage of that uh, agential capacity of the bots. Uh, the second thing is that this is von Neumann's dream, a, 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 a robot that's able to go out and make copies of itself by finding objects in its environment. So uh, this is a very early form of that. There's no strong heredity here. All the, all the bots look the same, but, but, but they do replicate. And so this is, we call this kinematic, uh, uh, kinematic self-replication. We've made it impossible for these guys to replicate in the normal froggy fashion. But within 48 hours, they, 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 they are able to do this. And so the last thing I want to I wanna just discuss is the uh, kind of evolutionary implications of this. This is a normal frog with a normal frog genome. Uh, when you ask, what does this genome encode? It's, it's uh, common to think, well, it encodes a frog. But actually what it encodes is a, uh, a, little, a little machine that can, it, under normal circumstances, it has a default frog developmental stages and normal tadpole behaviors. But under other circumstances, it can be a xenobot. It can form uh, the, the xenobot. It has its own developmental stages. Who knows what this is? This is a completely novel uh, thing. And then, of it, and, and then they have their own different xenobot um, behaviors. Now, we didn't add anything to go from here to here. We didn't add any, any new genes. We didn't add synthetic circuits, no weird nanomaterials. Uh, all we did was, was engineer by subtraction meaning that we uh, removed some other cells and we, we asked what is the native behavior of these cells? Because if you look at a typical embryo skin, you would say that what does it, uh, what does it know how to do? Uh, well, it knows how to, how to be a boring two-dimensional um, layer on the outside of the, um, uh, on the, outside of the, of the embryo. But that's because the other cells are basically bullying these cells, uh, behavior shaping these cells into doing that on their own, left to their own devices, this is what they actually do. This is the default behavior. So you can imagine evolution as searching this uh, space of um, behavior shaping signals that cells will send each other to get them to do what they want, uh, what, you know, what, to get them to do something, something adaptive. This is the default behavior of those cells. And the final thing is this. Uh, when we think about why does a certain organism have certain shapes, uh, behaviors, uh, properties, the answer is usually, well, evolution, because, because eons of selection have, have given it these particular goal states in anatomical space and behavioral space and morphological space and, 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 uh, and so on. But actually, uh, there's never been any xenobots, and there's never been any selection to be a good xenobot. So this is the, these, you, you, the, there's no straightforward selection story that explains these behaviors. So we have to start thinking differently about where goals in these spaces come from. And I think that's, that's very interesting. Um, and we don't know what the cognitive capacities of these guys are yet. We're working to understand what can they sense, what are their preferences, what can they learn, and so on. So um, I'll just stop here by saying that um, all of this is, uh, the, the, the conceptual stuff is discussed uh, in these papers, uh, which I'm happy to send to anybody. I want to thank uh, the, the uh, postdocs and the students